and Stephen Bloom. Yes. Who, well, I guess the question of who stayed up too late. Who stayed up too late? Who <laughs> didn't shower? Oh. oh. <laughs> That's Remember, deodorant is your friend. Con faux pas. <laughs> Actually, deodorant is the friend of everybody next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so remember. There's, there's a story to go with that, isn't there? I feel oh, there's, there's so many. Oh, yeah, there's so many S, so my, many cons. My nickname is deodorant. That's oh, what wow. That, yeah. He's French. I'm French. Deodorant. <laughs> Deodorant. Oui. Deodorant. Bonjour. Mais, mais oui, monsieur. Welcome to Stinky Saturday here. It's very fine, very nice. I don't want to call it really Stinky Sunday. Really stinky Sunday. Yes. <laughs> stinky Saturday and Stinky Sunday. Yes. Then? Uh, that, that's Those are my children's names. <laughs> <laughs> who has no idea who we are? Yes, Yay. honesty. Honesty is the best policy. Awesome. So did, did you get dragged here? Your, your buddy's like, dude, you got to come see these two people. You dragged them yeah. in? Well, you're wearing a Naruto uh, band. Yes. Do you, do you know what that is? It, you great. don't know Naruto. That's fantastic. At all. You, so you only this have is <laughs> awesome. This is all of our responsibility to educate this young man this weekend. Yeah, make him watch. And make him one of us. And one of us. And one of us. And you're so lucky because you get to watch like 800 episodes of a show you yeah. care nothing about. <laughs> <so>. Yeah. <laughs> I directed 635 of those episodes. <laughs> so, yeah. By, by the time this panel's over, you're going to be like... I know that voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the family. Thank you, guys, especially the ones who have no idea who we are. Thank you for allowing your friends to drag you here. Yes. That was awesome. We so appreciate it. Um, so why don't you tell them who you are for the three people? Who am I? Uh, my name is Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, and I started off uh, being rescued by everybody in B Television, from Chuck Norris to Xena uh, Warrior Princess to... Uh, Angela Lansbury and I got hurt on a set and Xena and I started doing voiceover and uh, about two years later after doing The Wanderers and Mysterious Play Fushigi Yugi which took me ten years to figure out how to pronounce uh, <laughs> Uh, which was kind of amazing to play one of the first, for me, uh, transgender characters, which was really amazing. So I love, yep. love, love playing Noriko. Uh, I got a call from the guys that did uh, Akira and Ghost in the Shell, the movie, and they said, we have too many shows and not enough directors. Do you want to direct? And I went, ah, I'm terrified. So yes, which I always feel is a very good, if you have the little monkey on your shoulders going, you're going to fail. That's usually a really good indication that you should try. So I did, because failure is awesome. Uh, and attempted failure is even better. So, and they handed me a little show called Cowboy Bebop. And I don't know why, but... So that was my first directing gig. And I started with Cowboy Bebop, and then went to Digimon, and Wolf's Rain, and Naruto. And now I'm directing original series, uh, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. And I also play D&D &D every now and then online. <laughs> woo, woo, woo! Yes, hellish rebuke for everybody out there. <laughs> for us, not against you, but for us all. Yes, darlings. So, uh, so that's it. And uh, I'm pretty excited. I'm so excited to be here. I haven't been here in three years, and I just love Sacramento, and I love how wonderful and, and generous and, and happy and excited you are to geek out with me about stuff that I love as much as you do. So thank you again for having us. We're so grateful. She's also a world-class singer. Did you mention that? Oh, I sing She's some Silent Hill songs. She is the singer for Silent Hill, yeah. if you guys know Silent Hill. So, yeah. That's fun. And she tours like all over the world. She's a rock goddess. Very big in Russia, apparently, yeah, because I think Russia is Silent Hill, yes. I'm feeling. So. <laughs> exactly. It's true. The sun never comes up in November. It's up for like three hours, and then it's like the perfect storm at the end. The sun comes out, and then it's like... And the giant wave comes, and there you go. <laughs> And uh, my name is Steve Bloom. I've been, I'll, I'm glad you like me. I love That's good. 
Uh, I've been at this for 30-something years at this point. My very first job in voiceover, as we were discussing backstage, was Giver, if you guys remember Anybody? That. The Giver, yeah. BioBooster Armor Giver? Yeah. Giver 3. Giver 3 and Agito in that one. I love and MacGyver. <laughs> completely different. Richard, Richard oh. Dean Anderson. No paper clips show. involved. <laughs> Dang it. Uh, no, so I, my first gig happened quite by accident. I had the deepest voice in a mail room where I was working, and they needed somebody who could do creatures. And they offered me free food, and I said yes, because I was a starving musician. And went in on a weekend, and they showed me an image of a monster ripping the arm off of another monster and asked me if I could do it to picture, and I went <coughs> And they said, yes, you're hired. <laughs> and I said, do I still get free food? <laughs> and that's literally all I cared about, and I just have, I've never stopped. I did it for fun for many, many years, and they kept hiring me because they were idiots and had nobody else, I guess. And uh, eventually, they brought me on to Cowboy Bebop, which ultimately changed my life. Uh, it led to shows like Megas XLR and Legend of Korra and Toonami and um, so, many, so many different incredible shows. I just had no idea if anybody would watch it. We didn't know at the time if anybody would ever see Cowboy Bebop. It really wasn't, yeah. there wasn't much of a market for anime except for the real hardcore otaku and most of them hated us for doing dubs at the time. Yeah. So we were just <laughs> praying that somebody would see it and not threaten our lives and uh, fortunately that worked out. So. Uh, I branched off into video games and commercials and movies. Now I'm doing uh, a lot of the Star Wars movies. It was just in Rise of Skywalker and uh, Rogue One and Solo and uh, um, Bumble Star Wars Bumblebee, Rebels. Star Wars Rebels. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's branched out into all sorts of different things. And I will do anything that is voiceover related pretty much at this point. I'm a voice. So anyway, thank you guys so much for having us back to Sacramento. I love it up here. It's an easy flight for us. We're from L.A., uh, so we're actually probably in better condition at this con than most <laughs> that we travel to <laughs> around the world, uh, and we are just so happy to be here. Thank you guys for, for uh, accepting us into this community. No, we're, we're so happy to have you back. I mean, we love you guys, and obviously they love you. So... <laughs> So this, this panel is for you guys. So Marcos is up here with a microphone. So if you have questions, please come on up, ask your questions. That's what we're here for. Let's do this. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be just about Cowboy Bebop. It can yeah, be anything. about anything. Uh, what, what but in the meantime, three, no two, one, right? one, let's jam. No <laughs> season, Thanks. I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. If he knows yes. <laughs> <laughs> say, ask me knows anything about Oh, here we go. I do want to say one thing. There was an amazing lesson to be learned with Cowboy Bebop. Uh, the secret to adulthood for all you young people out there is that every adult is winging it. Uh, so keep that in mind when you ever feel overwhelmed and not good enough and everybody else has more experience than I do. Everybody started off by winging it, by not knowing what they were doing and just trusting their instinct and being brave yeah. and jumping out of the plane when the monkey tells you, you're going to fail. Uh, because I'd never directed anything, uh, and Bebop was my first, and I just went with my gut, and that's what we all ended up doing. Worked out pretty well. Yeah, here we okay. are, 4,000 years later. Good morning. Hi. How y'all doing? Great. Good. Um, yes, I have a question for Steve Bloom. Yes. Um, is there any way you can convince Cartoon Network and convince Adult Swim to renew Magus XLR for a third season? Oh, I wish I had that kind of power, dude. I'm just a voice monkey. Uh, it's really, that, that one in particular is a rough one because it was used as a tax write-off. They didn't know what to do with it at the time, and so they used it as a tax write-off. So they would actually have to make some sort of agreement with the IRS to get that show back, the rights to that show back. Uh, and there's so many people who have been campaigning for that. My voice uh, talking to Cartoon Network is, it, they they would love for it to happen, believe me. Everybody, I'm really good friends with the, the top brass at Adult Swim. They would love for that to happen, but uh, it's really not up to them. It's about the rights of the actual show. Does Cartoon Network still own the rights to it? I have no idea. I think the federal government owns the rights to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was one of those shows, if you guys haven't seen Megas XLR, and thank you for bringing that up, it was really a love letter to our geek community, to giant robots and to anime and to action cartoons and to, to everything that's awesome. And we just made this silly, ridiculous show with an amazing cast, really fast-paced and fun music. 
And the network just, it was going through a transition at the time, Cartoon Network, and they didn't really know what to do with that. And the success or failure of a show largely depends on how they are able to advertise it and get it out there. And they just didn't put any budget toward it. It was one of those sad stories that just ended up dying way before its time. But all of us who worked on the show are still very good friends. And all of us have said that if we ever get the green light to go, we're in that studio as soon as they ask us. So, yeah, if you guys start flooding the network and, and uh, letting them know you want it back, I don't know if that'll help, but that's how we got Tsunami back on the air. So Yes. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thanks for watching. You're welcome. All right, bud. And thanks for being our first victim. I appreciate you, man. Very brave. <laughs> Good morning, Dutch. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. My question for Steve. Yes, sir. What was your favorite episode of Cowboy Bebop to voice act it? Anything that Julia was in. What? Ah. <laughs> How's that? That's good. Uh, I don't play favorites, man. It's the, the favorite thing is really hard for me because uh, I just I love everything as a standalone, even individual episodes of a series I work on. And Bebop, there are some episodes that really uh, stuck out to us, like Toys in the Attic. Mary was yeah. talking about that yesterday, just because it was kind of a uh, an homage to some of the sci-fi that we love, you know, 2001 and Aliens. And uh, it is also one of the few episodes that just had the main cast in it, so we could perform that live, which we've done for charity a few times. Yeah. And uh, so I love that episode because of that. Um, but Mushroom Samba was amazing yes. just because it was so weird. The Cowboy Bebop movie was probably my favorite thing of the whole franchise just because it had all the good bits and elements and amazing music that the whole series had encapsulated into one piece that I could watch in one sitting, and I'm really lazy, so I, I'm not good at binging. So I didn't see the whole show until uh, seven months ago, yeah. end to end, and we recorded it 21 years ago, so. 22 now. Yeah, and I've only seen it once through, so for me to pick a favorite is really hard. Do you have a favorite? Yeah. Um, no, I love them all. <laughs> I love them all, but yeah, Toys in the Attic, I yeah. loved. Uh, and what I loved, again, about the movie was that it gave you an opportunity, uh, and the writers, Watanabe-san, an opportunity to really go in depth with Spike. I felt like the series did so much for Ed and for Faye, uh, but to really get Spike in a vulnerable place, to have him just open up in the jail cell with Elektra, that was amazing and uh, difficult. Very difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good at the big, broad characters but to actually get vulnerable and have to feel pain to be able to deliver a performance was very very hard for me I wasn't good at being vulnerable I wasn't taught how to be vulnerable so she kind of held my hand through that whole process and it was hard that was one of the hardest sessions of my whole career I it's think. like dipping your toes into a really hot bath and you're like oh, I can't get in I can't get in it's like just ease into it and yeah. that's what we did yeah okay but thank, thank you for watching <laughs> thank you and Thanks, awesome Dutch. pants too yes <laughs> Yay. Hi. Hi. You look Good amazing. Morning. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to see you guys here. So thank you so much for coming. Of course. Um, I recently watched Cowboy Bebop to just refresh my memory of it and come fresh here. So um, I really loved all the characters and um, their development and what they went through. Um, and I was wondering, what were your favorite characters of Cowboy Bebop? Uh... Probably Edward for me. Yeah. I just love Edward. Ed and Ayn were so much fun. Uh, oh, screw Melissa. Ayn. No. <laughs> no, I love Ayn. I love Ayn. But as Spike would say that, right? Yeah. yeah. I was in character, guys. Give me a break. Wow. The, the room <laughs> turns so quickly. It's like, he doesn't like Ayn. I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> what was so much fun with uh, when Melissa... Uh, when I was directing Melissa with Ed is that normally for anime what we had done in the past is we usually stick very close to the Japanese performance and we really used uh, the actress who played Ed as just sort of an outline almost like looking at an impressionist painting or an abstract painting and it's just like okay now let's make it your own Melissa because obviously they you can't recreate what somebody did like that that's so specific to that actor. So we found Melissa's version of Ed, and she's a huge musical theater uh, star. So to use a lot of singing, incorporate a lot of play, was really something amazing. And nobody was in the room, it was just us. Like, I, I don't think we even had producers at that point. It was just engineer, myself, and the actor. And that was it for most 
of Bebop. We had very little oversight. I think they just thought, get it done. Okay, here's an interesting story. Cowboy Bebop, when it was first released, they released six episodes in Japan. They edited them, and they released them out of order. It flopped. It bombed. So they brought it to the United States. There was no oversight for us because they're just like, well, nobody cares about this show, so let's give it to Mary. She doesn't know what she's doing. And we put our heart and soul into it, and again, we thought nobody was going to see it, so let's make this incredible show for us. It's so westernized to begin with, so let's pull down the acting style, make it much more western, much more cinematic, uh, nuanced, subtle, Uh, And when it was re-released in English, it actually um, got a new life. And then it went back to Japan and it was released finally in Japan. And we got to meet the creators at, uh, was it two years ago? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and it was just an amazing experience to hear that from them. We never knew that. We had no idea that, Yeah, and they were saying that a, a lot of the success uh, was because of the English dub and they never would have been as famous as they are if we hadn't done our version of it so that that almost never happens it yeah. was, was, was kind of cool you guys did an amazing job oh, thank, thank you. you thank you I just wanted to highlight one other character on the show uh, in terms of the villains yeah. I think my favorite one was Pierrot Le Fou oh Pierrot Le Fou yeah. yes he was uh, and there was the, the guy who played him was a guy named Kevin Seymour who's the one who brought Mary on board as the director and he was he was this behind-the-scenes, very quiet, very shy genius who is responsible for a lot of the, the early anime that made it to American soil. And Kevin is no longer with us. He passed away a few years ago, but uh, he was a great actor, and that was the one character he decided he wanted to voice. And so he just jumped in, and, and I thought, oh, Kevin's going to do this? Oh, it's going to be interesting. I'd never s- seen anything he had done before. I thought that was one of the most chilling, amazing, terrifying performances of the entire series. Because the voice print was so different from the Japanese. At first I was like, oh, this isn't going to work because Pierrot had this very deep voice and Kevin was pushing to sort of get down there. It was really interesting. I got to direct Kevin doing that and Kevin had been directing me for years. He's the one who brought me in to play Motoko Kusanagi in Ghost Mm -hmm. in the Shell. And so it was, it's always fun to direct someone that's directed you. But yeah, it was very different than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. We just... So thank you for asking that. Um, thank you for answering. Of course. Sure. Hi. 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 This is for the both of you. Uh, what's been your most memorable fan interaction? Oh, man. Oh. There have been so many. <coughs> <laughs> Meeting when he Joe. licked my ear backstage. <laughs> um, do you want to start? There, I got two. There are so many. Um, what I never realized is that um, people in the armed forces overseas... Uh, Their downtime uh, is precious, and it's spent playing a lot of video games and watching a lot of anime. So we've had a lot of uh, members of the armed services come up and give us their mission patch and just say, Cowboy Bebop got me through my tour in Iraq. uh, Ghost in the Shell got me through my tour in Afghanistan. And the gratitude that we have for those people that have continued to sacrifice themselves to keep us safe is amazing um another one is that somebody in, uh said came up in vegas i think and said i've been wanting to meet you so that i could do this turned to his girlfriend got down on one knee and proposed <laughs> which was amazing so yeah. that was pretty fantastic that was cool well, you yeah. still want a mine but um oh one that's no, okay it's all i got plenty uh there was uh, a, a moment in new zealand uh, many many years ago and If you've heard this, please forgive me, but uh, it was so meaningful to me and it really changed my life on every level. Uh, There was a a man who had tattoos all over his body, huge, huge Samoan man, uh, who came up to me and told me that his autistic child had never spoken up until the age of eight. And he would sit in the corner and rock and they would have some communication between each other, but that was pretty much most of his life. Uh, And then one day he, they had something on TV during the afternoon and the little boy got up and jetted over to the couch and just sat transfixed on the TV. And the father looked at him and he said, what's going on? And the little boy just went, and he had never done anything like that before. And at the commercial, the little boy turned to him and he goes, I like this daddy in perfect English. And he had been holding on to this for all this time and processing all these words and thoughts and feelings all this time. And just didn't, didn't find the, the opportunity, I guess, to, to express himself. 
And it turned out to be Digimon. And uh, Gilmon was the character that this little boy connected with. And it opened up a dialogue. From that point forward, he would speak. And the family would sit and watch Digimon uh, every day together. And as this guy's telling me this story, I started crying. And he started crying. And he said it unlocked something in him that he didn't know was there. And uh, he got him involved in some otaku groups. And he started making friends in our global community of anime wonderfulness. And uh, the following day, I was doing a signing, and there was a line probably about as long as this, and the guy was uh, standing. I just see this guy towering above everybody at the end of this line. And I, I see him, and I go, come here. And he, he goes, no, I don't want to get out of the line. So I, I stopped what I was doing. I ran to the back of the line, and he's there with his wife, the little boy who's now 12 years old at the time, and the sister. And we just all hugged each other and talked and laughed and cried. And it was the most amazing thing to me that, that something that we did in a complete vacuum could have that kind of effect on somebody out there in the world. And so I'm, I'm just so grateful for that. that. That changed me on a cellular level. And it also changed my purpose as a person and as an actor to, to just do the best I can every day. Yeah. yeah so thank you for that, man. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, that's tough one to follow. So, question will be for each of you. What was the most challenging role that you were given and that you like to reprise? Oh. Mm. <clears throat> Physically, for me, Wolverine. Yeah. Uh, just because Wolverine kind of starts out here, but he never stays there. It's always ramping up and getting more and more angry. And then the fights start beginning. And it's like that through the whole thing for like four hour sessions. And so I, <laughs> I come home with my uvula dragging behind me. And, uh, and it takes three or four days of recovery. But I love that character so much. I'm willing to go through that as, as many times as they'll hire me. Yeah. Um, I play a witch in Hearthstone. Uh, Hagatha. Oh. And Hagatha is all in here. And it's just bleeding. It's just bleed. By the end, it's just like I'm just bleeding. My, my, I'm needing blood and it's mine. Uh, and yeah, so the vocally stressful ones are always difficult. But there was also, there's, there are emotional, emotionally difficult ones. I played Governor Price in Star Wars Rebels, and it was the easiest character I could ever access. For some reason, I just walk and put my hands behind my back, and all of a sudden, you are rebel scum, and you're going to die. <laughs> but what she did, I had never done, like the emotional and physical torture that she inflicted upon people, and what she eventually did to a specific character was so awful that I would walk into these sessions, I was so guilty and guilt-ridden, and Dave Filoni would purposefully put me on the side. So you've got the whole family cast of the rebels there, and I'm the Imperial on the side, and I was you know, instantly ostracized. It was such great psychological work by Dave just to put me over there and watch me destroy a family. It was, it was really hard. It was really difficult. She like, liked it. I <laughs> did, which has made it even worse. <laughs> we all have our guilty pleasures. Sure, why not? Thank you for that. Good, thank, thank you. you. Well. <laughs> yeah, that's a good clap. Hello. Hi. Good morning. So, I am a stage actor. Yes. And I've gotten many strange directions by directors. Yes. I was wondering what the strangest directions you've ever been given are, or perhaps either of you have given to others. <laughs> You first. Uh, <laughs> You're the director. I, well, it's more the characters that were strange than anything else. Uh, I directed a show for Disney called Pen Zero Part-Time Hero, and they go to the most dangerous un the galaxy in the, in the universe, uh, or the most dangerous planet in the universe. And at one point, we had to have a Godzilla-sized fire-breathing chicken. So uh, D. Bradley Baker, who played every clone in the Clone Wars and is just the most genius guy, came in and uh, we had to develop a, f a giant uh, fire-breathing chicken. And it was, uh, it was pretty fantastic, I have to say. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, just some tell what you tell thing. me. What? Just tell oh, so I, I, I would tell Steve, oh, it's a suck less. That's my favorite yeah. direction. Another to give take, people. suck it's less. Like, oh, yeah. Okay, let's try that again. And <laughs> suck less. Uh, yeah, which is really good. One of my favorites was um, 
it was in the same session. She said, okay, could you do next one a little softer but more hard? And I went, okay. And maybe a little purple. Little purple in that one. And I went, okay. And I, I just did what I thought would sound right to me. And she goes, that was purple. Good. So good. <laughs> so this, yeah, so, yeah, you just roll with it. It's, it's fun. I've, I've had some where it sounded, oh, I was doing some scream. And a director, it was on a video game. I think it was Call of Duty. And the director told me to, uh, to do another scream with more meat in my throat. That was pretty fun. Meat? More meat in my more throat. More meat. Yeah, because I think a zombie had just exploded and I was yelling at it or something and I had a little bit of zombie meat that in the throat. It was too vegan. You yeah. have to be more cannibal. <laughs> more cannibal in that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah, we get some really good ones, especially when you're doing creature work. You get some disgusting direction. D. Bradley Baker posts the directions that he gets sometimes and, and it's just unbelievable. A little more beak on your chicken, I, you yeah. know, stuff like that. His most recent one was whistling nipples. Yeah, <laughs> whistling nipples. Yeah. What does that even mean? I don't know, but he did it and I'm sure it sounded exactly like whistling nipples and I can't believe you said that out loud. I she know, hates it's that my word. least favorite word in yeah. the world and I'm trying to get used to saying it. I'm so proud of you. I hate it. I don't We're know We're all why. growing here. It's like most people hate moist. I have no problem with moist <laughs> nipples. Everybody has them. I don't care. Even the I don't dog. Like the <laughs> well, thank you very much. I don't know how we got there, but thank you for putting yes. up with us. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I took us there. I Everything <laughs> always comes back to whistling nipples, just so we know. It's sad. name of my next band. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, my question is about in acting and directing in Cowboy Bebop and other series, I'm sure, especially in Cowboy Bebop, there's subtleties in the characters and in the dialogue. Like when Faye says, oh, Ed, anything but blue. Without access to the writers Ugh. or what they thought about the history of the characters, how do you develop the backstory of those individuals and the story that could be that's not shown on screen? Well, I mean, what's great about great storytelling is that hopefully you're given the great story to tell, and we were. Uh, and everything that happened with Faye and that wonderful moment, we rely on amazing writers. Uh, Mark Handler uh, wrote most of this from the Philippines, I think. Uh, from a boat. From a boat or a <laughs> beach. Uh, and he was a brilliant writer. So it's um, relying on great writers to choose very specific words to express something that is so deep in a very simple way. And that line in particular is a great example of that. Because... As it is with anime, a lot of the time we don't get to see the end while we're doing it. Wolf's Reign's one of the few shows, and Naruto, that uh, I've seen the whole thing before we actually get in and direct it. So with Bebop, I'd only get three episodes a month for me to figure out where we were going with Faye, but you could see that she was starting to peel away the layers more and more and more as we went. So with Wendy Lee, it was really coming up with something on the fly to just get her in a place that will trust the story at this point will unfold in later episodes mm -hmm. what we've established here because we're sort of matching the Japanese intention and we could hear that the actress was getting darker and more vulnerable so we just had to find a way uh, and I'm sure Wendy came up with a backstory in that moment uh, to justify that particular read of that beautiful line that was written by a man on a beach in the Philippines, <laughs> uh, translated from a genius script done in Japan. So it's a lot of cogs in a big old machine that get us to that moment. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah, but I think every actor has to come up with some sort of backstory when there's no context. Mary's wonderful at providing context for us because we had less information than she did. We walked into the room and they had a script in front of us and it was like, beep, 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 go. And she would provide whatever context she could to at least get us into that universe in that moment. But I think that's the, the beautiful thing about uh, different versions of shows. You have the Japanese version of it, which most of us had never seen. And we come in completely naked, and it's, it's like a fresh palette uh, working to what's on screen with the context that we have. But we are creating our own backstories moment to moment to moment. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But that's, that's the beauty of, of uh, doing a... a a localized version of something is that you're going to bring all of your sensibilities to it from that localized perspective. And I think that that carried through in Bebop probably more than most of the anime shows that I've worked on because we had a little more time to play with it. 
a lot of them it's so fast and furious or you've got the Japanese client in the room saying they want to match the original Japanese exactly. Bebop wasn't like that. We could actually do what we could in our own way um, for that show. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi. Uh, first, I want to say thanks for uh, being part of a show that, uh, for me, was a huge gateway into anime, and I'm sure for yes. a lot of people here. Sweet. Um, so my question is just a kind of a what if question. So what if Spike's story at the end of Bebop didn't have to end there? What if he could be brought back into another anime? Which anime would you like his story to continue in if you were allowed to do so? Which anime? Like an existing anime? An, an existing anime, yes. Oh, man, I have... Or even Star Wars, since you've worked on that. That would be kind of fun. Um, He'd be a really good Mandalorian. Don't you think that Spike would be a good Mando? I He'd think be Man a good Mando because he's a bounty hunter. Yeah, yeah, sure. That would make sense. This is, I don't way. think he'd wear the helmet, though. It wouldn't fit over his hair. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't this the way. No. <laughs> he could stick a out very of special. A very special. <laughs> he could uh, cut holes in the helmet so the hair would just stick yeah. out. <laughs> he'd be the he'd like be the Choji and Naruto. You just have the hair <laughs> sticking out. Yeah, he'd start his own thing. He'd be a little rogue squadron off to the side, call himself a Randalorian or something. I don't know. Yeah. I just made that up. You can have it if you want it. Yeah. Copyright pending. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's an amazing thing to think about. I don't know enough. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't watched most of the anime I've been in, so I'm probably the worst person to ask. Have you put thought to that? Uh, honestly, it just came to mind while I was standing in line. And uh, the question that I was originally thinking of was, after so many years after Bebop was created, is there anything that you would change going back? No. It no. was, was kind of answered early with so many other well, questions beforehand. Well, here's the thing, and we talked a little bit about this to people who were at the panel yesterday. Is a thing, uh, it's a funny thing about regret, uh, because the fact that we're here now, if we had changed something going when we were doing it back then, we may not be here now. So the fact that we are here means that everything we did led us to this point. So I don't want to change anything that we did back then, because it might not lead us here. It's, it would lead us to an alternate timeline or something. Yeah, Reality, I, butterfly I, thing. I actually <laughs> had to sit with that recently because I, I did watch Bebop for the first time end to end this last year. And watching it so many years later, my acting skills have gotten better. So I would see certain moments in certain scenes that I go, oh man, I wish I could go back in and redo that. And then I had to kind of center myself and try to give myself the same advice that I give to my students, which was, this was who I was at that time. And, and Mary was good with my read at the time, and so were the producers, and it stuck, and it's okay. It's okay exactly the way it is. And it's also part of my own autobiography. If I look back into the work that I did back then, I'm still proud of it because that's who I was at that time. Your audio biography. My audio biography. Thanks. Uh, I just made that. You can have it too. Wow. Awesome. Trademark. Thanks for that question though. And yeah. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. So the short answer is don't beat yourself up over what happened in the past, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, You're aware of it now. It's good. Hi. Um, so my question is, what's your favorite anime that you didn't star in or direct? Death Note. Ooh. I love Death Note. That's one of the few series that I wish I could have worked on. Like, we campaigned hard to Viz, and they sent it to Canada, and they did an amazing job. But I remember seeing Death Note. I was like, oh, that is so cool. Nice. So cool and dark. I like the dark stuff. Like, Seven's one of my favorite movies, you know. So uh, I loved Death Note. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, Trigun would be mine. Ooh, yeah. so good. Uh, I, was, I was a writer for Trigun. I wrote most of the ADR scripts for most of the episodes in that show. And I, I didn't think that anybody would ever see it, so I used my dog's name. So in the credits, it's my dog's name. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, I, had, I gave myself one little teeny tiny role in it. I don't know if you remember that show, but I um, there was an episode with a giant baby and an old man. Uh -huh. And I was that old man. Oh, that's Don't great. touch my son! <laughs> yeah, so... That was really fun. I just love that show. I love the music. I love the style of it. It was really yeah. cool. And it was Johnny Bosch's first uh, yeah. Yeah. animated show, at mm. uh, fresh out of Power Rangers. So it's right exciting on. to see him here at the con and how he's exploded over the years, too. No, it's yeah. not. <laughs> not really. All right. Thank you. Thanks for that, man. I'm kidding. I love Johnny. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Hello. Uh, my question is, have you ever hit a low point in your career where you're just going, what am I doing? Why am I still trying to voice that? And if, what brought you back to say, I love my job? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I had that three months ago. I, I was directing eight shows, and they were all ending, and I just thought, well, I'm never going to work again. <laughs> and what am I going to do? And a week later, I had four more job offers. So there's something to be said for persistence and faith <clears throat> in your own abilities, and I know that's really, and in the universe, that will bring something, uh, present itself to you. Uh, it's hard. It can be really hard. I think everybody, especially actors, suffer from uh, what's the syndrome where you, you're the imposter syndrome, yeah. where it's just like at some point everybody's going to find out that I don't know what I'm doing and that I have no talent whatsoever. Uh, and especially that will come through like a chest burster <laughs> when you're in between jobs and you just think nobody's ever going to hire me again. Nobody's ever going to hire me again. And I'm a terrible, and you, you know, the spiral, you start to spiral downward. But you just have to have faith in your own abilities and get out there and create something. Even if nobody else is seeing it, <clears throat> write a poem, draw a stick figure, do whatever it is. Because in moments of darkness, creating something can be a very powerful light and can bring you up, yeah, out of that yeah. moment. Thank that's, you so much. That's Steve, awesome yeah. advice, actually. And that's, that's uh, again, what I tell my students all the time. I go <laughs> through lows still. Yeah. I still have this this year was really not a very busy year for me with voiceover and so I put a lot of more of my concentration into teaching I'm teaching voiceover online and to other pursuits I'm working on meditation stuff and uh, all, all sorts of other creative pursuits and there's a lot of things that you can do in that downtime to still express yourself and throughout my career there have been moments like right after I quit my job at a, a really really good executive job at a film company and I quit that to go into voiceover full time after I booked my first 7-Eleven commercial. I was the, the voice of 7-Eleven for a long time. The guy who says, oh, thank heaven at the end of the commercial, that was me. Yeah. I thought I was going to build multiple houses on that, show, on that commercial. Uh, right after I booked that first commercial, I quit my job. And then the union went on strike and I was out of work for a year and a half. And uh, living on credit cards. And uh, then had to get three other jobs to support myself and my little voiceover habit. And the, the industry is very cyclical like that. Even after being in this for 30 years, I'll still have three or four months of almost nothing happening other than tsunami. And uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have that going. It's an ongoing thing, but it's not a regular steady gig. So it's, it's gonna happen at every stage of the career. And when you get to those points, you have to find something that does make you feel good. And fortunately, this voiceover was the one thing that made me feel good when everything else sucked in my life. So if you could find that thing, whether you're making money at it or not, do that thing in the low points. Uh, and, and that will lift you back up. And surround yourself with people who will also encourage you through that too. Yeah. So. And Steve made a really good point. This industry does go in cycles and it changes. One day we're going very big, over the top cartoony, and a month later the trend is very naturalistic and very subtle and quiet. So. If you find that you're not working as much, tune in back into the industry and see if there's been a shift. And if it has, then just be aware of that in your own work and just think, all right, this is, we're going through a much more naturalistic time. I'm going to pull down my performances to match what is trending, you know? And you still have your own set of tools. You're still using all the, the, the skills that you had. You're just adjusting yourself to fit back into the industry. Yeah, and if you're a voice actor, that's great homework. You get to watch cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do a lot of research online. I watch a lot of videos and things. So when I had downtime, I was watching a lot of other people's performances and what's going on right now, like she was saying. So there's a million different things you can do to keep yourself occupied and also go outside. If you're in oh, yeah. one of those downward spirals, make sure you spend some time get off outside. off social media and just yeah. take a walk. And the, yeah, the sunlight you know? and the air actually can, and plants, like real nature can actually rejuvenate you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Spiko. Spiko this. Yo. Yo. <laughs> so I have questions for the both of you. Okay. What are your favorite lines as Spike and Julia, if mm. you have any? I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. <laughs> nice. And I do. Mm -hmm. And we're engaged because yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. In case you didn't In real know. life. In real life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for Julia, it, you know, Julia didn't have that many lines, but uh, cause she came in so late in the series. But for me, it was, it's all a dream, and it is. So, yeah. live it well. Yeah, yep. just a dream. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Hi. 
sorry. I'm really nervous. Oh, okay. don't be. It's just I love us. You both. We love you too. Thank, thank you. you. We love you. Okay, for Mary, since I know you're a huge D and D fan, because I've watched all of Critical Role and knowing you as Zara. Yay! Thank Yay. you. I love Zara. She's she's amazing. Thank you. What sprouted your love of D and D as just what fun did that? Oh, fine, I'll give in to it because I watched your Between the Sheets with Brian Foster, of course, yeah. with you slowly like yeah i'll give into it but what prompted that what was like fine i will do that thing well i mean they asked when the, the first time they ever played D D was for liam's birthday yeah. uh and uh god we had just gone to this video game awards show and laura was just like and i was in a really bad place and laura said why don't you come play D and i'm like no i'm gonna go home isolate stupid so I think it was just, I didn't know what it was, and I didn't say yes, and I, you know, a voice was like, just do it, and I shut it down. So I think it was when I finally just said, just do it, it's improv with dice, and the first time I, I was playing online, I was yeah. like, oh, this is amazing, and I'm so stupid that I didn't say yes to this, but I won't regret it, I'll just enjoy it now, because now I'm in the place where I can accept it. So. Uh, that was it, really, just getting on there and spending a week thinking, yeah. what are we going to do about the Frost Giants? Like, I'd be it out loud audio. You and got the final kill. Come on. You got I the know. final kill. It was great, but, you know, Sam and I are in between sessions, and he were, he's directing El yeah. Ellen of Avalor, and I'm directing Tangled. And I was like, do you think I can use mass suggestion on the Frost Giants? You know, and he said, I said, am I allowed to talk to you about this? And he said, probably not, but that could be a really good idea. And I was like, okay. You know, so it's uh, it was amazing. That's what I love about D and D is I, I I killed an ancient an, an adult white dragon. I woke up the next morning and feeling and a beholder and a beholder. But after Rhymefang went down, I woke up the next day just like I know it wasn't real, but I killed an adult <laughs> white dragon yesterday, <laughs> and I felt so empowered. That's, That's what so I love nice. about D and D is that basically it's world building with your friends and then problem solving instantly, and you are dependent upon the decisions that you make and the actions that you make right there. And the dice and is the chaotic it's thing. A game of risk. Yeah, totally. It's so yeah. much fun, and you have to say yes. I think it must. Be, it would be great for kids, for, for D and D, because if you want to get in that that room, but the door is locked. How can you get in the room? You have to figure out a way to problem solve right there on the spot. So yeah. encourage and you, your kids. And you get to collect minis and cool dice. I have so love many. Little I love dice. I have so right? many dice. Right. We, we have all these little minis around the house, and Brian is one of our dear friends. So, uh, He's and our Will, dungeon master. And Will, uh, Will Friedel, who yeah. has his own oh, painting show, mini Kasha. painting show now. So Thank we're going to have a little painting party at our house soon. We, we love that stuff. It's really fun. We're action figure freaks anyway. So we have, we're going to yeah. really But for me, it's the dice. Game. I found a, a sphere, a meteorite sphere on eBay, and I sent it to Gil like a year ago. And I've been very, very patient. <laughs> but he sent me a picture of, we're getting there. We're almost done. And I was like, oh. But I kind of don't want to get it because I said, once I get my D20 meteorite D20, I'm not going to buy any more dice. <laughs> sure. Which is terrible because all I want to do is buy dice. You're so. not going to become a Laura. Don't become oh, a Laura. She already Dad, has. I have too drawers. Late. It drawers. It is way oh. too late for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now it's finding the unusual ones. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. That's that's I'm a, I'm I'm afraid that is time for today. No, Go so no, fast! No. Wow, I have so many more questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're here all weekend. We'll be uh, over in the corner signing uh, this afternoon twice for two different signings, I think. So yep. if you have any more questions, just come by, yeah. and I know you're going to have a lot of questions. Seriously, 800 episodes. We'll start on one, and then we'll just work our way through it. Yeah. Um, want to do a little plug? Fine. Do you have a, a pl anything you want to plug? Anything I want to plug? Yeah. How much I love you. Oh, I like oh, that. I, I love, love you, you too. so much. Bye bye. I love you too. No, uh, I just watched Star Wars and, and Tangled and She Ra's coming back yes. and so many. Uh, Carmen San Diego. I play Coach Brunt in Carmen San Diego. <laughs> Vile Training Academy for Thieves. Uh, that's coming out very soon. Uh, all kinds of good stuff's happening. Cool. And tonight is Toonami, so if you're so inclined, stay up. <laughs> And watch some Toonami. And then also there's a new show on Netflix coming out this month called Kipo. 
and the Age of Wonder Beasts, I think it's called. I can't tell you who I'm playing on it yet, but it is going to be an amazing show. There's a trailer up online now. It just went up a couple days ago for the new trailer. Uh, and then uh, I am teaching online at bloomvoxstudios.com, and I have cards on my table, so come and check it out. Thank you guys yes. so much for having us. Don't forget to love each other. Give it up for Stephen Mary once again, everybody. Thank you so much once again for coming to our show. We love Thanks, you guys. Guys.